So my name is Tina van der Vleert. Uh, I'm the head of department of earth science and engineering at Imperial College London and I'm a professor for isotope geochemistry. The journey I'm going to embark on uh, in a couple of weeks actually is uh, down to Antarctica. So this is a trip which is part of the Swayze to Sea project, which is an international project. And I'm uh, one of the co-chief scientists of that project. And our goal going down there is to drill a hole through the ice shelf and through the ocean into the sediment below to learn something about the history of the Antarctic ice sheet. The expedition is really special in that we go to a place um, no science team has been gone before to try to go drilling so we go um, four hours away from the um, base station scott base um, very much towards the center of the west antarctic ice sheet and that's the part of antarctica which is most vulnerable to melting so we see it melting um, a lot at the moment but what we don't know is under which environmental conditions it will completely lose its eyes, uh, collapse, or how quick that will actually happen. So by going to this particular location, we try to find um, the sediment record, so the historic record of what happened there in the past. And Earth's climate was one, two or three degrees warmer in the past. So by just getting the sediments, we already hope to get a lot of the answers. I think the one thing I always say is that we can't really predict the future. Uh, we can only project it. So uh, there is no such thing as a perfect analog from the past for the future. But um, when we look at Earth's past, um, the Earth has changed naturally quite a bit from warmer to colder times back and forth. Um, and particularly in the recent past, and for us geologists, the recent past is like 100,000 years ago or 400,000 years ago. Um, there were times where the planet was between one and two degrees warmer than pre-industrial times. So that is the temperature range we're looking at right now. And what we don't know at the moment is what the Western Arctic ice sheet did under these environmental conditions. So we don't know how much ice it actually has lost. And that's really what we want to try and figure out by getting the sediments. And then we'll take them home, do chemical analysis and, and hopefully learn all the detail. For us here in London, uh, and it's very counterintuitive, um, melting of ice in Antarctica actually matters more than melting of ice in Greenland. So um, we have at the moment two big ice sheets um, sitting um, on the poles, the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet. And the Greenland ice sheet holds um, water or ice equivalent to water if you would melt it all, which would raise sea level by seven meters. Um, Antarctica holds more than 50 meters. But the smaller part of it we're really interested in because it's very vulnerable. The West Antarctic part holds about five meters worth of sea level rise. So when you lose that kind of water from Antarctica, what you actually feel here in London more is when we lose ice in Antarctica than when we lose it in Greenland. And that has to do with how the solid Earth responds to um, sea level and adding mass to the ocean. So uh, there's really interesting science behind that. But here in London, for example, of course, we are at sea level. We have a river going through our city. And um, at the moment, we have the Thames barrier keeping our feet dry. So whenever there's kind of a storm flood coming in from the North Sea, it gets closed and it gets closed quite a bit in recent years. And for every centimeter, really, sea level is going up. That becomes more and more uh, a risk for us here in London. So the Thames barrier has been built to basically deal with sea level rise um, sufficiently for the next 10 or 20 years, but if we think now sea level is going up by half a meter or even a meter by the end of the century, that would have really strong effects on us as well. Last year, we went out with um, 27 people um, into our deep field camp, as we um, call it. And um, we set up our camp and we set up all our drilling operations. And um, nobody has ever done this before. Nobody has ever set up uh, a deep field camp so far away from a base. Uh, with that amount of people. Um, people have before drilled just holes through the ice shelf, so we knew we could do that. But nobody then has drilled kind of into the sediment that far away from a base. So we developed over many, many years a new drilling technology, and that was extensively tested um, in New Zealand um, to, to figure out how, how to do this. And uh, when we deployed to the field, we set all of this up. That takes a few weeks till you actually get to that point. 
Um, and we drilled our holes through the ice successfully. We then lowered instruments through the hole. Uh, we collected some data on, on the ocean cavity underneath the ice, so what the temperature is like in, in the ocean underneath there, what the currents are like. We let camera down, so we got some pictures from the seafloor, which was super exciting to see. Um, and we got some short sediment cores, um, and that was really, really good as well. But then when we tried to deploy our drill rig to actually do the deep drilling, so the goal was to get 200 meters of sediment, um, we encountered some, some technical challenges there. We had to basically hold our drilling very quickly. The good news really was that we knew immediately what was wrong. It was just we're too far away from civilization to fix it because we basically needed a um, different drill pipe. And we've ordered that now and it's in Antarctica and it will actually go uh, on sledges on a traverse tomorrow, leaving tomorrow um, to go out uh, to our drill site. So uh, we think we fixed the thing that stopped us last year. and. Um, in retrospect, we think last year was just a wonderful opportunity to test out everything. Um, when you do something as challenging as what we're trying to do, you probably always need a shakedown season to actually uh, test out everything for real. So we are extremely optimistic that this year we'll get our 200 meters of sediment core. I think one of the most exciting things about going is escaping the gray winter in the UK um, because winter in Antarctica is actually white and uh, beautiful. So uh, the place where we are is, is still close enough to the coast that it's not super duper cold. So it's on average minus 10 degrees. So last year we had between minus 5 and minus 15 degrees uh, was the typical temperature. Um, it's very often sunny um, and that is beautiful. Once it gets cloudy, um, it, you can't quite see anymore where the floor stops and the horizon starts. It gets uh, really kind of white in all directions. Um, but overall, um, it's cold. When it's not too windy, it's quite pleasant. We have a couple of tents which are actually heated, so there are places where we can warm up. Um, but yeah, we work in tents, uh, we sleep in tents as well, um, and um, it's just a bit colder than here, but you get good clothes, uh, and so you can deal with that. Yeah, I think one of the coolest things about our project is that it really is a large international project. So we have um, over 100 scientists from, I think, about 40 different countries involved all together. Um, but the scientists are just one part of the equation. So going to the field, there will be uh, 12 of us in the science team, and I think we're from seven different countries. Uh, so that is already quite diverse. Uh, but then we add on top of that the drilling teams. Uh, so those are mainly engineers, mechanics, um, electricians, uh, the, the people who, who make the magic really happen. Uh, they come from a couple of different countries as well. And then we have a team of um, camp staff who help us with all the logistics. And uh, very importantly for camp life is there's a cook in there as well. So we'll have somebody uh, who will actually cook us food. Uh, there will be a medic in there as well. So if somebody falls ill, we have kind of, you know, medical expertise uh, on site. So in total, there will be 27 of us, um, but coming from very different walks of life. So as I said, scientists are just, you know, a small part of the team. And um, I found that last year incredibly enriching. So um, obviously your your recreational time is, is a bit more limited towards what you're doing here. So in the evenings, you just sit in the one warm tent you have um, and you can play some board games or, you know, you can um, uh, watch some movies. So we bring a little projector with us as well. But you mainly talk to each other and you really get to know all the different people who are out there together. and big challenging projects like that only ever succeed if you work well as a team. So I think that's to me one of the really, really cool things of getting to know each other and bringing the best out of everybody really to make the project a success. An average day in Antarctica doesn't actually look all too different from a work day uh, back home. It's just a very different environment. So um, last year, um, I normally woke up between six and seven in the morning. Um, I'm somebody who needs a little bit of time in the morning to just wake up. So you don't want to talk to me before I have my first coffee. So if you only have one place in the tent where everybody gets their coffee, you have to develop different coping mechanisms, uh, what to do to be awake before you meet people. Um, but yeah, you start with breakfast uh, in, in the one warm tent where, where our food is and the cook kind of works. 
And then we always had around eight o'clock a morning meeting where everybody who works in the camp gets together. We get the weather forecast for the day. We talk through some health and safety briefings. And then we normally split up in, in the different teams. So the engineers will go to the drill tent and do some preparation work. The scientists will go to the science tent and kind of, you know, get, get ready for their operations. Um, and, and then you just basically um, start preparing for the science uh, you want to do. Uh, so we spent last year a lot of time in the beginning looking through the workflows, assigning jobs, getting familiar with all the equipment, um, writing up procedures. Um, and uh, you have lunch, you have dinner, and at some point you call it a day and go back to your tent and sleep again. The drilling we do is based on um, technology called hot water drilling, uh, which actually um, has been uh, really pioneered and done a lot here um, in the UK by the British Antarctic Survey as well. And the New Zealand team uh, adopted a method uh, which is similar to that. So what they do is uh, they basically um, have two big flubbers, we call them. They like massive swimming pools. Um, and in the beginning, we put a lot of snow into these flubbers. Uh, so you melt the snow um, to create water and that then goes through some boilers and gets further heated and the water then comes out of a nozzle of something like a garden hose really um, and you spray it into the ground. So you, you have to imagine we stand on top of 600 meters of ice. It's floating ice, it's sea ice, but it's still 600 meters. So you want to have a hole that goes from the top to the bottom of the ice shelf. And you start doing that with a very small diameter with your nozzle, with the hot water. And then you kind of add like a different kind of device around it. We call it the Christmas tea. And then it sprays water in all directions. And you widen the diameter of the hole bit by bit till you have like a centimeter, 30 centimeter wide hole. And through that, we can then lower the equipment um, to the seafloor. The depths we want to drill to is 200 meters uh, so there's the 600 meters of ice 50 meters of ocean and then we want to go 200 meters into the sea floor i think one of the fun things when when i normally give my talks about um, my antarctic work is like you start off with a dot on the map in london here and then you think about what what is the journey actually and so of course you start with, um, for the part of Antarctica where we're working, West Antarctica, you start with a flight down to New Zealand or Australia normally. So I fly to New Zealand. Well, that already takes two days to get there. Um, and then in New Zealand, um, in, on the South Island in Christchurch, there is actually an Antarctic air terminal, whether you believe it or not. So all that terminal does is um, it stages flights to Antarctica, not just for the New Zealanders, but the US program flies out of there as well. The Italians fly, it, uh, fly out of there. So different people who have bases in Antarctica use that. And um, it's an eight hour flight if things go well from New Zealand uh, in an old kind of military machine um, down to Antarctica. It's very noisy. Um, and then you land on the ice with, with your aircraft and then you go to the base station. The New Zealand base station is called Scott Base and it has room for about 100 people. And the way you can picture that is basically like a container village uh, on the ice. Uh, so we sleep in bunk beds. It's a bit like being, you know, in school again, uh, youth hostel style, uh, four to six people in a room. Um, there's a canteen for everybody where you get your food. And in that base station, they take us through some basic training. Um, they call it Antarctic field training. So particularly for people like I went the first time last year when you've never been, they want to take you out for a night and make you sleep in a tent at minus 10 degrees to see whether you freak out or whether you're okay with that. So there's, there's a, a bunch of basic training you have to go through before you're allowed to deploy to the field. And then from Scott Base, it's still another four hour flight to the site where we then actually build our camp. And when we arrive there, it's just plain ice. There's nothing. And I think the most amazing uh, moment I, I witness is when you land on that ice and you get out of that airplane, um, you see the sun reflecting on the ice crystals on the surface. It's just the most magical place, really. Um, and then you just build your own village there. And then at the end of the season, take it down again to leave the place as pristine and magic as it was before. How long does it take to build the camp? Um, I, I think it took us um, a good week or maybe even a couple of weeks to set up all the tents we need. 
um, and to get all our facilities ready. So of course you start with uh, putting up your sleeping tent. That's the first thing you need. And then the warm tent where, where we do the cooking and where our social space is. But then all the science places you gradually build up, the big drill tent where all the science happens in, I think that took a good two weeks till we had that fully set up. Um, and yeah, you go from there. I'm, I'm really, really passionate about this research. And I think it's, it's really, really important. All of us doing this work are, are very climate conscious. Uh, we have a huge consciousness for sustainability as well. So flying around the world and doing a big drilling operation uh, is probably something you could question. Um, but as humanity, as our planet is, is warming, um, there are so many consequences of that and rising seas is one consequence, melting of ice. And the melting of ice we can observe over the last, you know, 100 years or so from Antarctica is getting quicker and quicker. And for the time period we have satellite observations, we can see it's, it's really dramatically accelerating in certain parts of Antarctica. And West Antarctica is one of these parts. And that mainly has to do with the fact that you get warm ocean water getting to the ice sheet and basically eating it up from below. So it's melting from the top and from below. Um, and that means we're losing ice quite quickly. And in the climate science, um, we all know that sea level rise resulting from ice melt is one of the slow components of the system. So basically the sea level rise we're seeing today is not yet in equilibrium with the warming we've seen on our planet. So that means everything we do today has a commitment for the future. And we need to know what we're committing ourselves to because we need to know um, how we need to adapt. We need to know what our mitigation targets are. And the fundamental answer for West Antarctica is that we at the moment don't know how fast the ice sheet will melt and under which exact environmental conditions there might be tipping points in the system. And it's quite important for us as humanity, whether we live in London where sea level rise will tackle us or whether we think of hundreds of millions of other people who live along the coastlines of the world, we need to figure out uh, what we are committed to. And um, it's really only the data we collect out there from the sediments course which can answer these questions. So we are very passionate about this research, um, but we also, many of us are, are real optimists. I'm an optimist, uh, the glass is always half full. I think there's a lot we can do to limit warming to below a dangerous level. There is a good chance that we still might be able to limit it to a level where the Western Arctic ice sheet is not lost. And we need to know that. The 20 hours daylight get to different people in different ways. Um, I, I did think beforehand, before I went last year, that I wouldn't care at all because I'm pretty good at sleeping anywhere, anytime when I'm tired. Um, I did not sleep really well when I was out there. So everybody takes um, eye masks. I think uh, multiple ones is normally the advice to really um, get, get rid of the light. Uh, it doesn't help that all the tents are yellow, so that kind of just amplifies the lightness. Um, and you just basically pull your sleeping bag over your eyes and over your mask um, and, and hope for the best. Um, the most annoying thing is when you wake up in the middle of the night uh, and then you just really awake because it's light. <laughs>